Hi, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Daniel Rosell. Daniel's Tech World, the guy behind this YouTube channel. Um, so today I want to make a uh, video, just a video blog, talking about backups because I never really expected or thought that backups would become something I'd be making YouTube videos about. Um, I never really planned to have a YouTube account. I just kind of decided in the last few months while I was making these blogs and updating my GitHub repository that I would join the video craze. I'm kind of doing it partially just to learn how it works. Uh, but also I'm kind of hoping by just making these videos and showing these things I feel like I'm kind of just contributing to this ecosystem of knowledge that's really helped me out uh, over the past 10 years. So that's basically the stuff I've been posting about backups, my screencasts, how to do this, how to do that, what works, what worked, what doesn't work. Um, it's all really based, uh, it's actually for documentation so I'm making a lot of, lot of it so that I can actually refer back to it, refer back to my, I've already referred back to my own Medium stuff, GitHub stuff, YouTube videos. Um, the thing about backups is they are quite complicated or they can be, they can be complicated. Uh, but they're the kind of thing that if you set them up and you test them, and I'll come on to that in a bit, how extremely important it is to test your backups, to do a test restore. But once, once you have that down, um, you're basically good to go with one caveat, your data tends to change. So for example, I just started creating these YouTube videos and that means that on a daily basis, I can now easily be generating one gigabyte of data, at least one gigabyte. If I'm doing a podcast, that could be 1.5. Um, mostly up to now, I've just been writing the odd infographic. So there's been a pretty dramatic change in the volume of data I create. And as I'm not gonna call myself a backup enthusiast and I'll explain why in a second, but as a somebody that takes backup seriously, um, that basically changes. I now have to think. I have to think a little bit more in terms of storage. Do I have enough capacity on my NAS, my network attached storage, to uh, to back up all this video data? How do I want to back up this the videos I'm putting up to YouTube? Do I want to back up the original files, or uh, can I get away with just downloading the downloads from YouTube? The downloads from YouTube. If you are a YouTuber, they are compressed. So you just noticed you might put up two, 300 megabytes up to the cloud and you'll get down about 50 if you, do, if you go through the download as MP4 option. So which do you need? For, for this use case, for me, I'm happy just uh, downloading the MP4s. These are not amazing videos, although I'm trying to always make them better. Uh, if I was a professional videographer, I'd probably want to be downloading, I'm sure I'd want to be downloading, both the pre-production footage, the post-production footage, all in original quality, and maybe I take a backup of the compressed footage as well. So basically, your backup strategy, um, if you have one, uh, it's kind of something in flux. It does take a bit of planning, but it's the kind of thing that, although it's a pain now, I've never spent as much time uh, thinking about backups as I have over the last few months. It's just, as I said, I thought this time, let's do something different. Instead of figuring out what backups I'll need for the next year or two, every time I figure out some piece, I'm going to write it up on Medium. I'm going to put a video up on YouTube. And that way I'll have something for me to refer to. And if there's anybody else that's wondering, for example, how do I do a restore, a clonezilla restore onto Linux, which is what I demonstrated yesterday, they'll be able to check out my video. And in that way, as I said, I'll be kind of spreading, spreading the backup knowledge. So backups are something that, um, I mean, I would say most people probably should have some kind of involvement in backups. So I currently uh, work for myself, I'm self-employed, technology writer, um, so my backups are a mixture of, you could say, business backups and personal backups. So I always try to keep the two things separate. Um, there's no strict uh, necessity at the moment for me, but down the road, if you're looking at compliance, you're looking at permissions, who can see what. So it's a good idea, even if you're just a one-person organization, as a freelancer, if you are backing up your stuff, I recommend, for example, I have G Suite for my business and I have G Suite for myself. I like to keep everything separate. I have two phone numbers. Um, so I'm doing a mixture of business and personal backups. Uh, you might just want to do personal backups. If you're working in a large company, so in a 500 person company or even just a smaller company, backups are not something you will ever have to think about. You, you have an IT team, but uh, that's part of the fun of being a small business unit or a freelancer or an entrepreneur or a YouTuber is that you have to kind of think about this stuff yourself, look for resources yourself, figure it out yourself. So I actually really enjoy that. Um, okay, my backup story. So as you said, I'm not a backup enthusiast. I'm somebody that takes backup seriously. Ba backups are not fun. There's no real enjoyment. Uh, you know, maybe the odd time you didn't expect, 
you're you figured out this new methodology to incrementally back up your web server and yet like yesterday i did a restore that worked perfectly i mean it's a little bit fun in a geeky way um but i wouldn't really describe myself or really anybody i think is a backup enthusiast um <clears throat> I've take, I have I take backup seriously. I've always, my backup origin story, and that sounds completely ridiculous saying this, um, I've been using Linux for probably about uh, 10 years at this point, a little bit more, I think actually 12 years. I figured out the exact uh, month, month, and I've forgotten it. Uh, my laptop broke down and I brought it to, I had a friend and his brother was kind of, you know, one of these uh, <laughs> technologically geeky people. I guess I guess someone would probably call me that nowadays. Uh, so I brought in my laptop and it was like the Windows blue screen of death and he was like, well, just use Linux. So I was like, okay. So that got me into Linux. I've been using Linux ever since. Never really planned to be a Linux person. I worked at uh, startup companies that were flexible enough to allow me to use Linux so long as I had like the occasional Windows access. Back in those days, we used Wine. Nowadays, there is uh, VMware and VirtualBox, but... <clears throat> I've been lucky enough to actually never really have to use Windows for like more than 10 years. Um, I do use MS Office and Windows from time to time on the virtual machine if I need to. Um, but that's, uh, this is actually partially why I love the cloud and I'll come on to the cloud. I love the cloud because cloud is OS agnostic. So you can uh, edit a Google Doc from Linux just as well as you can edit it from Windows or from Mac. Um, if you get into uh, Microsoft Word and LibreOffice, you tend to get into more compatibility issues. So as a Linux user, my dream for computers for many years, and I don't think it's ever going to happen, is, although actually with, uh, with Dockers and containers, this is kind of, the reality is shifting a bit at the moment. But my dream is always to just have like a really, really simplistic um, operating system. I'm looking at my computer here. Um, and uh, to have everything in the cloud. Do absolutely everything in the cloud so your operating system was minuscule. There's a concept called thin computing. I figured this out recently. I, I, I asked a question on Quora to see if this, anybody had ever thought of this, if it was a thing or whatever. It's never really caught on, but the, the technical term is thin computing. The idea that the local operating system is minuscule, like bare bones, as I said, something really light and Linux based, and everything you do is in the cloud. Um, so I've been use, using Linux for a long, long time, relatively speaking. And the annoying thing about Linux is, uh, as everybody who uses it knows, it's kind of a little bit unstable. Now, there's reasons for that. Um, you can have it more stable. So I've gotten better over the years at just best practices. For the, the biggest one, uh, in a nutshell, what you should do if you're concerned about stability and you're using, let's say, something like Ubuntu is to stick to long-term releases. Don't go for the new releases. So by going LTS, long-term support release, to long-term support release, um, by not using too many third-party APT sources, there's things you can do to make the computer sturdier. Um, but particularly, I mean, I've evolved with Linux. So in the course of the time I've been using it, it's actually become better and better. But during the early days when I wasn't so good, I wasn't so familiar with the command line, bugginess, etc. Um, I would like just Linux would periodically break for me. Like it could be something like swapping out a graphics card and the new driver breaks or the upgrade breaks it. And this was like, okay for like a year or two. And then it started getting really annoying. Like you can kind of justify it, justify it to yourself because you're thinking you're like, well, I guess I'm installing fresh so I can get rid of the stuff I didn't use. And I can say each time it's like doing a spring clean of your operating system. Um, so that rationale kind of was what got me mentally through a few years of using Linux. And of course, every time it happened, it happened at the worst possible time. And everybody was like, why don't you use Windows? Um, so that kind of uh, self-justification was fine. When it really became a problem was when I started working for myself a couple of years ago. And then you just be like, in the, I remember being in the middle, I had a bad uh, SSD drive a couple of years ago. And it took me a while to figure out that the it wasn't actually the operating system. The actual drive itself was corrupted. It had bad sectors. So it kept breaking. And I was like, in the middle of work for clients, I was like, this cannot continue. I need to like figure out some solution. Um, other horror stories in my past include, uh, I remember I had a malware attack a couple of years ago on my hosting. So I just moved between two hosts, which is like the worst possible time this can happen. My, my hosting, got, I used to host with SiteGround. My hosting got too big for their limit, so I moved over to, I found a reseller host. 
wasn't a good experience. Um, but I remember moving over and it got, I got attacked like right after the move, which apparently isn't just a coincidence when you're changing over DNS records. It, you know, there is, that's a vulnerable period. There's people scanning and rescanning, uh, doing surveillance on your network. So basically it happened then. And I was like, well, I've left SiteGround, so they don't have any backups. I remember I was on a backup plan for them and I joined this new host and I assumed there was backups, but there were no backups. So I was backup less and it was like this network of 10 WordPress websites. It was horrible. Absolutely the worst possible thing that could happen. And it's this Russian malware I wrote about on my blog called uh, Baba Yaga. It's this crazy Russian uh, mal WordPress malware that basically I was looking through um, just the websites and they were like com just complete write-offs. It got, it got down, it got physically into the MySQL databases. I was looking through these WordPress sites and I could see there was like fake WordPress sites, uh, fake WordPress files, as in like they looked like part of the WordPress file structure. They were actually part of the malware. In the real WordPress files, they were corrupted. I tried a few recovery solutions and basically nothing worked. The worst part was that because this was just a basic shared hosting, there was no isolation, so it started in one website and just propagated like this, like this. So all the websites were corrupted down to the databases. And uh, it, was like, it was just like a horrible, horrible two weeks. I basically had to just, uh, I think two websites were clean. Hey, websites were not clean, including my danielrosehill.co.id. All these, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, posts, archives of all my writing work over the years. And I had to, I won't get into the technical details here, but there was a way that I could scrape out some data. I couldn't capture the plugins. I couldn't even capture the WordPress upload folders. I could just capture the uh, some export folder and import, but basically that was a complete disaster. Now I had actually taken a few backups of my own, but they were too out of date. So this, it, what I would have done differently is before moving host, I would have uh, back up, backed up my entire web infrastructure, every single cPanel, get a download just before you leave the old host. Um, and, you know, so you can start with the new one and if anything drastically happens, you have a backup. Ideally, you'd be running a daily backup, an incremental backup, but uh, at the very least, just take a full backup. Um, so basically, that's why I got into backups, namely losing data, uh, other stuff would be like accidental deletion, like I've lost a couple of, I had this great uh, mp3 clip from when I was in journalism school. I don't know exactly when that was lost, I think somewhere like rebuilding websites, I forgot to copy over some mp3, overrode a previous backup, so there's a lot of stuff like this. I would say most people, um, you know, if you're hosting websites for 10 years, or probably at some point you're going to either lose files, or you're going to have a malware attack, or stuff happens basically. Um, and backups is what you want to do in order to prevent, to mitigate the risk of stuff happening. So let me just refer, refer back to my notes over here. Um, okay, so there's a few other points about, about backups. So the first, the, the kind of knock on to that point, uh, why backups are great. Backups now having a really good backup system. So it's been like two years, two and a half years, I think actually, since I last had to reinstall Linux. That means my system has been up for two years. I have in that course had to use backups. So not really backup snapshots technically, time shift uh, is a Linux command tool, but basically I can't tell you how much this has helped my productivity by being able to update my system, play with my system. Uh, I don't have to worry about breaking things because I've described in another video my backup strategy. I have two backup strategies just for this Linux computer. One of them is time shift. That's like a, it's like system restore windows. You just create snapshots daily, weekly, monthly. Um, and I can just in like two minutes roll back if uh, let's say you do an upgrade, it breaks the system. So that's number one um, recovery method. The other one, which I haven't even had to use once uh, in the two and a half years has been Clonezilla. So Clonezilla, which I showed yesterday is a disk imaging tool. Uh, that means that it basically, it's a really hard, hard tool by which I mean it's low level. So you run it on a live USB, and it just exactly duplicates uh, the drive to another drive. I put it onto my, sorry, I don't put it onto my NAS. I put it onto another uh, drive in this computer and it's at the block level. So it's literally copying the data. It's like there's also a Cronus true image. Uh, Symantec had a tool called Norton Ghost. I don't know if that's still in existence, 
and there's a Mac tool which I forget the name of, but they're all the same thing, disk imaging tools as opposed to backups. And that's like my, you know, if it hits the fan, backup. So if the restore points don't work, um, I'll be able to just uh, copy from the backup image onto the computer. So basically it means um, instead of taking, I would call it like four steps forward and two steps back every 18 months in terms of using Linux, I can just take four steps forward. Uh, because I know that anything that's going to go wrong to my system, I roll back to a backup. Now, question is, what two backups? Remember I said earlier in the video I talked about that. I think most people really need to backup. And the reason, have, have some kind of backup strategy. There's backup and there's disaster recovery, DR. DR basically means restoring, a restore in simple terms, recovery. Uh, it's what happens when stuff goes wrong. So... A big part of backup planning and having a good backup approach is you want to always run a test restore. And if you want to be really fancy about it, you want to have a uh, run book. Run book is your documentation, like the stuff I described on Medium, describing exactly the steps you'll need to follow in order to restore the system when the, as I said again, the stuff hits the fan. Um, so um, what do people need to back up? So basically, I wouldn't say every piece of data you own needs to be backed up. I would say that the, the, piece of, the pieces of data that you cannot afford to lose need to be backed up. So if you order a takeaway tonight from an Indian restaurant um, and you get a PDF order of your copy in the email, to be honest, I would say unless that's expensive and you need to add it to your accounting system, that's not like critical data. That's data you could probably live without. In some cases, you can't live without that data. You need to keep all financial records. Um, what, I, what, I, what I back up basically is, it's more, I would say backup is more a mentality than a set of practices. It's basically as soon as I create data. So I install an app on my smartphone or I install a program on my uh, Linux computer or I put a blog post on my website. When I do that, I am uh, adding, uploading images to WordPress I am uh, making changes to the MySQL database that serves, that serves the WordPress content. So basically every single day you're creating backups. So if you want to do backups 100%, get yourself the best possible coverage. You need to be doing something like running a daily incremental backup of your phone, a daily incremental backup of your hosting, a daily incremental backup of your computer. Now what's the difference? A full backup is copying A to B in full. An incremental backup, um, every time it runs, it tracks the changes to the file system. So most, and then you've got differential, which is the changes since the full run. Incremental is every time it's an incremental, incremental, incremental. Differential is changes to, from full to the current system. So most modern backup approaches, you do not have to economize because they all tend to use incremental stuff. If you don't have a system that uses incremental, it's not ideal, and you'd be surprised as to how common that is. So yesterday I was discussing um, Google, for instance. So I use G Suite on my two accounts, and every day you're uploading YouTube videos, you're sending emails, you're adding calendar appointments, you're always creating data on your G Suite. G Suite, there are G Suite backup tools. Uh, there's one by Backupify, uh, Spanning, um, Commvault, I think I have one as well. So there's a few of them but they all tend to only focus on a few things that, uh, because they're enterprise tools. They're designed for um, you know, a system administrator at a 500 person company, and they, they want to take a daily backup of all 500 users. Now, if you're one person, there is a lot of things in a Google takeout. There is Google My Maps, there is uh, YouTube, a massive one, if you're an active YouTuber, that that's not included in any of those tools. Now, Google have a thing called Google Takeout. It allows you to basically um, it's like a grab it all tool, but it's not intended for backup. Why is it not intended for backup? You can tell because it just spits out the full archive every single time. When I did a Google takeout today, because I've got YouTube videos, my archive has grown to uh, 55 gigabytes. That's really not efficient. I don't want to be downloading 60 gigabytes of data every single day and having to put that up to the cloud because I have a home in internet connection. But even if I didn't, that would just not be efficient even from a cost standpoint so that's not an ideal backup situation the current situation and it's kind of crazy to think about it because how many people use google and g suite on a daily basis but um that's it that's the situation we have to work with at the moment there are there is no tool my dream tool of google takeout that's incremental 
what's changed from yesterday to today. Okay, we'll pull in this data and we'll back it up. Now, when you do backups, you want to do backup in three, two, one. I've talked about this in pretty much all the videos. Three, two, one means you have your primary data source, like your YouTube account, and you want to take two backups, two backup copies. So it's primary plus two equals three. Uh, two of those need to be on different storage media and one of them needs to be stored off-site. Different storage media means you don't want to take a backup of your phone again onto your phone because if you lose your phone, you've lost your backup. Or your hard drive fails, you've lost your backup. So two different storage media and one of those should be off-site. That means in different locations. So don't take a backup of your phone and just keep it in your home office because if your home office catches fire and your phone is charging, you've lost the phone and you've lost the backup and you've lost your data. So you want to keep always one backup off-site. That means physically different. Um, some people will say the more physically different the better. So what if an asteroid hit your city uh, or there was a flood in your neighborhood and your off-site backup is in your friend's house that could happen and his house is flooded too. So there's a certain point where you start getting into very unlikely scenarios, but that's a general picture is three, two, one. Three primary plus two uh, backups, two different storage media, one of them off-site. Um, so that's covered why why backups back I mean it's not an exaggeration to say that backups uh backups have changed uh a lot for me. Definitely changed productivity. Um I don't have things happen anymore like my computer, uh an upgrade breaking my computer, I will always have at least two backup options. Uh and that alone has been like a game changer, literally. I know it sounds like uh it sounds a bit ridiculous, but uh has been a game changer. Okay, so point two. Um you don't have to pick and choose which data to keep. So this is actually a point about off-site backup storage. So it's become ludicrously cheap. Data in general storage is in a continual process of becoming cheaper. Um, so I commonly recommend Backblaze B2. I have no affiliation to Backblaze, at least at the moment. And it's really, really cheap cloud storage. So basically you can store like tens and hundreds of gigabytes um up there in their cloud for like you know almost nothing for like cents or for most dollars now how much is your data worth how much are your wedding photos worth how much are how much is your computer worth keeping that's it it's worth your time is worth money uh, and if that would save you from in a calamity from having to do a restore it's worth it super super cheap um what else is cheap on-site storage hard drives are pretty cheap um and if you actually want to do it like the pros they use something called lto tapes it's people don't think tapes are still in existence if you don't think that listen to the restore it all podcast my top backup recommendation for today a really really interesting backup podcast they talk about tape a lot so lto tapes are like these mechanical tapes just physically right onto tape they actually have a longer service life than hdd and sdd bit rot is something you want to be concerned about with backups it just means that basically um when you're archiving stuff, uh, data doesn't just, you can't just leave a hard drive on your desk and expect it to work. Even if there is hard drive technology in 200 years, uh, it would probably have bad sectors and may have so many bad sectors that it would not be readable. So um, basically storage degrades over time. Now for on-site storage, a solution to that is to use something like an NAS, like a Synology device, and that will run a check and fix bad sectors. And it will tell you if the hard drive is uh, is failing or has failed. And when you have something like RAID, RAID is a system that you have a few different hard drives or SSDs, and it can survive different, there's different RAID types. Uh, you have some RAID types where you can survive like three concurrent disk failures. That means three drives can fail in a 10 drive array. The, ar the array is connected, so the 10 drives are like kind of like put into one file system with LVM. And if one or two of those fails, um, you will still be able to have all the data. It'll just get, you'll just get, it's, it's really cool. You'll just, get, you'll just get a message saying the uh, storage pool is degraded and please add some and you put in another hard drive and you're back in business. So um, stuff like RAID and NAS technology, consumer NAS technology has meant that it's actually, it is possible for your average Joe like me to, um, to store stuff for archive for a long time. So that's kind of cool. If you know how to do backup and you have you have the equipment, you have an NES, um, you have you know a Backblaze account or Amazon S3 Glacier or Wasabi for that matter. These days, you don't need to be economical about you know oh there's like high res wedding photos and low res wedding photos. I'll just take the low res photos. You you don't need to just uh, 
6, 10 gigabytes, put that up to the cloud, keep that on your hard drive, you may as well have the high res photos. Um, I actually wear glasses and I don't put them on for this YouTube video because I need to see I'm in the frame and it's distracting if I see myself uh, with glasses. So I take them off. Uh, so if I look a bit weird, that's the reason. Um, okay, point four in my handwriting here, reduces stress. Uh, this is actually a big one. So I mean, it uh, doesn't need much elaboration, but basically uh, I'm much, much more... Um, confident knowing that you know I have at all times backups of everything 321 backups of everything SAS hosting uh, G Suite data uh, my computer my laptop my media center it's all backed up on my trusty NAS which is in that room over there and everything is backing up automatically to the cloud via CloudSync which is a tool so if you get a Synology NAS and I'm not shilling for a Synology here um, but you, it comes with the software called DSM and that just allows you to, um, that's actually I think most of the value in an NES is cloud sync automatically, you just create sync jobs between uh, the cloud and the NES. Now of course you can do this yourself using stuff like Arclone and an NES is just basically connects those drives onto the network. So, okay, final point um, and this is a big one so I, wanted, I, wanted, I want to give myself just a few minutes to explain it de-risks the cloud. Okay, if I am a big cloud advocate, I discussed that, I think that, you know, there are certain people that can't do stuff on the cloud, but to be honest, it's actually uh, diminishing in pool. Even the CIA, believe it or not, the, uh, you know, a federal intelligence agency, AWS, have been able, and this is kind of mind-blowing, AWS have been able to provide um, secure enough cloud infrastructure that they're able to use it. So that's, you know, for sharing... I know there's different classifications of like, you know, I don't know a lot about the intelligence world. Uh, I know there's different classifications. I don't know if that's like just top secret or classified or whatever, but bottom line, uh, intelligence agencies can be, feel confident enough that AWS is secure enough, well encrypted enough to feel confident storing their data. However, there is a big point about SaaS. Now, here's, I advocate backing up SaaS software as a service. That stuff like Salesforce, that stuff like pipe drive, that stuff like your ERP, that stuff, and th that's on the business level, on the consumer level, that stuff, that stuff like Todoist, that stuff like your G Suite, that is stuff like, you know, any, any of these cloud services that you own. Um, and there is a good reason for that. So basically most people, don't take my word for it, but most backup people uh, will recommend that. These guys on Restore It All have a good podcast about why to backup SaaS. Uh, spanning backupify now they're selling it they are vendors but they will all advocate for it um, but not not being a vendor just being a backup as I said enthusiast um, I actually 100% endorse that I've been using SAS for probably 10 years probably most people have I remember using G Suite back when it back when it was called Google Apps and with SAS you don't really own your data you're giving your data over to somebody else now, the most common reason that people will say, oh, you don't need to back up SaaS is because they assume that the vendor, the SaaS company is doing backups. And that's probably the biggest, one of the biggest myth, myths uh, that are out there. Um, so there's a few things. Firstly, they may not be back, they probably, probably are backing up your data, okay? A few things. A, it may not be a uh, good enough backup. They may just be doing a full backup every three months. You may, you may require for, for good backup protection, good data protection, at least, let's say, a weekly incremental backup. Secondly, um, even if they do backup, there was a famous case involving Salesforce that they talked about in the podcast recently. You may not be able to actually get that restore. That, that backup, they might be keeping that for their own disaster recovery planning. That means Salesforce do back up, let's say, their data centers, but that backup, they're keeping that for a situation in which like the whole uh, service is degraded, there's been some update got into production, and it's another one of these uh, stuff hit the fan situations, they need to just restore the whole data center. They're not necessarily going to restore if you say, our intern accidentally deleted two, 300 customer records, they're gonna say, and I've seen this happen, by the way, I have seen this happen physically. I've, all these situations I'm describing, I have witnessed. Um, they're gonna say, tough luck, basically. Um, I have to give an example. Um, when I was like 15, 16, I did this uh, exam, a Spanish test. And uh, this is another example why you should back up your cloud stuff and actually back up anything you don't want to lose. 
I did the Spanish task given by the Spanish cultural body back when I was living in Ireland called Instituto Cervantes. And uh, now back then I had a different name. Daniel Rosal has not been my lifelong name. I was born uh, actually my late father's name, which was O'Carroll. So I, you know, took the Spanish certification. It was uh, Nibel Intermedio, which means the intermediate level. And I went up to Dublin and I wrote the exam and I passed the exam and I got a certificate. And the certificate is, no one knows where that is. I did it when I was 16. Now, this isn't really critical. I'm sure it's not gonna be helpful for my career, for, but recently I said, oh, you know, I should probably, uh, I should probably get that certificate. Let's see if I can write to Instituto, Instituto Cervantes. So I wrote to Instituto Cervantes and I said, hi, this is me. I uh, did this exam 10 years ago and I've changed names since and here's all the legal documentation to show that I changed my name and I know I was in Dublin. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, I couldn't get access to the account. They were like, here's your Hotmail address. So I tried to go into the Hotmail back before I was using Gmail and I couldn't recover the account. There was no way it was like, whatever the security questions were that I configured or something like that, I just couldn't get in there's no way I'm going to be able to retrieve that documentation ever. Um, so that's another reason why there's stuff like accidental deletion, uh, you can be locked out of your account and you don't own your data, but that, that's really the biggest one. So if you look at the terms and conditions of what your average SaaS company says, you might be surprised to see that it will say backup is the customer's responsibility. Um, something I have seen as well that's really frustrating is testing out different CRMs. I was testing out CRMs uh, a few weeks ago and no a few months ago and you know I tried out one and I was like yeah that was nice I like that anyway it expired um, I had disabled auto renewal because I was like trying it out I had maybe like one or two hundred leads sitting there in the CRM so it expires so I write back to their their team and I was like uh, I've decided I want to continue paying for the CRM uh, I, this is my account it's expired but my data has gone and they're just like, oh yeah, your data's gone. There's nothing we can do. So um, in many, it, it, now it depends on the SaaS company, but uh, in some cases they do literally, if the accounts expire, there's an automatic uh, cron job on the, and this could actually be done for compliance, believe it or not, in some cases. Uh, they just wipe the customer's data. So any data that's important to you uh, sitting in the cloud in some kind of SaaS service, I recommend keeping your own data. How do I do this? I'm, I'm one of the few crazy people that literally every three months I will go through MailChimp, Todoist, I have about three MailChimp accounts. I will literally go through service by service by service every piece of data. I'll actually manually write to Quora uh, to say, hi Quora, can you please pull out a data export for me? And they'll do that and I'll add that to my cloud storage and that will come down to my NAS to give me two backups. So I literally do this routine so that is in a nutshell the explanation for what I what you could call the backup mania. I've been doing backups um, for probably ten years as long as I've been using Linux. No, less less than that. I would say I was always tinkering with backups, and I only really, after these uh, couple of uh, unfortunate events, I only started really saying this is it. I have to take it super seriously now. So maybe uh, let's let's cut down that ten years to like three years. But uh, in any event, uh, enough that I've been able to yield the uh, benefits of doing backups well. Um, documenting, that's really important. Document, and that's, as I said, my initiative here is uh, don't, because you, you'll, you'll forget this stuff so easily if you figure out a way to back up your web hosting that works for you, and it involves, uh, you know, uh, bash scripts and whatever, I guarantee you in nine months, you're not gonna like remember, you're, you can remember what was the SSH port, what was the command, where did I put that again, was it incremental, was it? you're not gonna remember this stuff. So as you go along developing a backup strategy, you also want to, document, 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 document. I don't use the word religiously, but uh, methodically, let's say. Document methodically. Um, so yeah, that's basically all there is to say about backups, I think. Um, final thing to say, sorry, is that, and your approach is evolving. So as I said at the start of this, I'm now doing video content and I'll probably just be thinking, I, used to pro I should probably speak to a friend who's in the, a videographer and I'll say, Hey, uh, let's call him David. Hey, David, how 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 do you back up your stuff? Um, you know, or I'll Google and I'll find a Reddit thread, or I'll find a Quora thread, and uh, it's evolving. So as the as the volume of data you produce changes, 
as if you go from hosting on reseller hosting to v VP, VPS, I'm getting confused with VPC, all these acronyms are in my head, uh, to reseller, to dedicated, you're gonna have to change your scripts. You're gonna, so basically it's not something that's static. So I recommend reviewing your backup strategy, let's say two times a year. And again, I'm, I'm not qualified, I'm not a, I'm not an IT professional that can make these recommendations for a business. I'm just recommending other, uh, other amateurs in general, in general terms about how you should approach backup, especially other freelancers. Um, most, I will say one final thing, and that's that I know a lot of freelancers who similar to me, and this is again why I started doing my own backups, is that you lose clips, lose, you can lose clips quite easily. If you write for websites and those websites go offline, um, you know, it's pretty common, you'll lose your clips. So, um, so basically, keep your own, I've done another video about that, how I back up my writing. And so even if you're just, just a, a freelance writer and you might think, yeah, I don't really need to bother with backups, I would say, actually, I think that's wrong. If your laptop is really important to you, if, if you happen to be using Linux, look at my methodologies, Time Shift Clonezilla. If you're doing Windows, it's actually pretty hard to go wrong with the Clonezilla backup, but you can use a software backup too. And uh, you can back up your writing, back that up to your computer, then you back up your computer. And then you put those on Google Drive, so you've got one copy off-site in the cloud and you've got one local copy. And just get into the habit of every time you publish an article on some other person's website, you go back up. So as I said, backup's like a mentality. Okay, copy that PDF down to my computer, put that up to the cloud. If you want to be smart about it, create a sync job. You need, oh, that's another, you need automation for backups if it's going to work. You don't want to rely, you want to rely on the least possible extent to anything uh, working manually because when you're lying on a beach in six months, uh, you're not really gonna care about backups. And backups are things that it's best to just do well, test well, and then leave them run, run for themselves. And you can get on with your life. And that's the biggest advantage of backup is that it allows you to use the cloud fearlessly, de-risks the cloud, um, prevents you worrying from stuff like breaking your computer. And as much as it can be a bit, you know, annoying and tedious to figure out your backup strategy, once you have a good one in place, you actually, the benefits accrue. So I think it's one of those, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Long, long tail of returns, long, long tail of benefits kind of things that it's worth that little bit of time and you'll actually be yielding the benefits for years to come. Thanks guys, hope this video has been interesting, engaging on some level for people. Uh, and if you ever wanna get in touch, I welcome correspondence, whatever you wanna call it. My website is Daniel Rosal with two l's.co.il. Or you can just drop me an email uh, and you don't have to use that weird domain for that. You can just, you can just drop an email to contact at Daniel Rosell with two L's again, dot com. Thanks for watching.